Morning guys, Dr. Jillard here. Let's start a new subject. We're going to start the heart. This is cardiovascular and pulmonary pathology. This is week six. This is the first lecture of the week. This is the Tuesday block. And yep, anatomy of the heart. <clears throat> We're also going to talk about a propate and foraminal volley as well. So anatomy of the heart. Now, I assume you know these terms, but if you don't, it would really behoove you to spend some time and bring these back up into your memory. If you don't know these, it's going to be harder to understand what I'm talking about, right? Uh, the pipes, and know the pathway through the heart that the blood takes, superior inferior vena cava. Let's go over here. Make sure you know the flow of blood through the heart in particular. You won't understand things if you don't understand the flow. So let's go through the flow. What's this? Superior vena cava, this. Inferior vena cava, what do they do? They dump blood into the right atrium. Okay, there's the right atrium. Great. The blood goes from the right atrium through these. What are these things called? Tricuspid valves. Can't see the other one. And would actually the blood would actually be coming out of the plane of the page if this was an anatomical position heart. The right ventricle is up closer to us, and this is more in the back. That's not the furthest structure in the back of the heart, though. This left atrium uh, is the most posterior structure. So this heart is just cartoon so we can see everything. All right, so blood comes into the right ventricle, then it's ejected during ventricular systole out through these important valves. No, you, if you want to talk about them collectively, you say that, the semilunar valves, uh, or the right semi, you never call this the right, so this is always the pulmonary valve or pulmonic valve. Right, so blood goes out this thing, which is the pulmonary trunk. It splits, dead ends, and goes this way. What's that? Pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein? It's going away from the heart. It's got to be an artery. Oxygenated or deoxygenated blood? Deoxygenated blood. It's going to the lungs over here to get filled up, right? The pipes goes into the lungs. And then it comes back, two pipes come back. I guess you can't see. But it comes back into these pulmonary arteries or veins. Pulmonary veins. The blood dumps into this thing, the left atria. There's four inputs to the left atria. How many inputs? Be careful. How many inputs are there to the right atrium? Careful. No, not two. Remember, there's an ostium for the coronary sinus here. So the venous blood from the heart itself gets dumped into the right atrium. So there's three kind of blood inputs in the right atrium. That's fossa ovalis. I think they're trying to show fossa ovalis there. All right, so now we got blood going through this important valve right here. What's that one? Yeah, but... Don't call it that. No one ever calls that that in, in clinical pathology. It's the mitral valve. You could call it the bicuspid valve, but it's the mitral valve. Okay, blood gets into the left ventricle. Powerful contraction occurs, and where does it go? We know this already. It goes through, well, what are these valves? Good, the aortic valves. How many cusps on these? These semilunar valves, how many cusps? Three. Great. Uh, this first piece right here is called the good ascending aorta, first branch, brachiocephalic trunk, or here's one you don't know, a nominate artery. This one, left common carotid, this one, left subclavian, this, descending aorta. Make sure you know that that flow through the heart, so it will behoove you. I like saying that word lately. 
All right, let's talk about the mediastinums. There are two divisions of the thorax. These are regions. You can split the thorax up into spaces. There's a superior and inferior mediastinum. Superior mediastinum is big. Uh, well, there's a, let me tell you about this line. In the sternal angle of Louis, if you stick a poker or, or whatever straight through, it hits T4. That separates the superior mediastinum from the inferior mediastinum. So the heart lives in the inferior mediastinum. More specifically, the, the inferior mediastinum is broken up into three parts. There's an anterior division here, green. There's a middle division, and then there's a posterior division back here. All right, where does the heart sit specifically? In the middle division of the medial, the, of the middle division of the inferior mediastinum. Got it? Okay, there's that horizontal plane. If you stick it through the sternal angle of Louis, and it goes, it's supposed to hit T4 there, drawing's a little bit off. We can also use that sternal angle. Did I teach you that in spinal palpation? You can find the second ribs there. Right? If you find find the sternal angle and you palpate straight out, that'll be the second rib. Okay, coronary vessels. You should know these as well. And I, I think you do. But if you don't, you better. There's a right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. Those are the main pipes, and those come off the trunk of the ascending aorta. Right? The right one, well, let's let's go to a picture and let's show you how to do these things. You can read about that. But let's look at a picture, kind of a see-through picture of the heart. So here's the ascending aorta here. Pulmonary trunk has been removed, really, so you can, because that would be over the top of the ascending aorta. It's been removed, so we can see. Uh, so this is the left from here to here. Uh, this is the left coronary artery. Right, comes off the trunk of the aorta or the right or the left coronary sinus. We'll look at that in a second. It doesn't last very long. It's like the spinal nerve. It's going to split into two divisions. This one we've seen in lab. This is the big one that goes down the center. That's called the left anterior descending artery. Left anterior descending artery. And anatomy, a.k.a. for it, is the anterior interventricular artery. It goes in that inner ventricular sulcus. It runs in a groove there. Right. The next big branch is really just kind of a continuation. This is called the left circumflex artery. And now we're going around the backside now. Left circumflex artery. Usually peters out. We're on the backside of the heart. Usually peters out before the posterior interventricular sulcus in a right-handed system. This is a right-handed system. There's a left-handed and a right-handed coronary system, and then there's a mixed system. And how do you know if you have a right or left system? You look to see who makes the posterior descending back here. About, I think it's 70% of the time, the posterior sending artery is not made by the left circumflex. It's made by the right coronary artery. The right Let's do the right coronary artery, and I'll show you. Then I'll talk about those branches. So right coronary artery comes out of the coronary sinus. Is it coronary sinus? No, it's not coronary sinus. There's a name for that here. Let's just say for right now the root. Uh, but it travels around. It jumps in the coronary sulcus. right? But this jumps in a coronary sulcus as well. The circumflex follows this coronary sulcus all the way around the back. The right keeps going. It rounds, goes to the back side of the heart. Okay, And if it morphs and turns downward like this, uh, this is the posterior descending or posterior interventricular artery. But if it turns like that, uh, then this is a right-handed coronary artery system. right? If it doesn't, if it peters out, 
And then the left one comes down and makes this up. It'd be a left-handed system. Okay, a couple major branches. Let's go to the left coronary artery. Splits into the lad, and it's the left circumflex artery. Off the left, left circumflex, you have another big branch, and that's called the left marginal. Sometimes it's called the left obtuse marginal, or just left obtuse artery. And there's almost, there's almost always these are doubles, even triples sometimes. All right. And then on this side, when we are wrapping, just as we start to wrap around the right coronary artery, wrap around to the back of the heart, it gives off a major pipe here, and, and that's called the right marginal artery, sometimes called the right acute marginal artery or just right acute artery because the angles they create, this angle is more acute than this one. This is more obtuse, the angle between circumflex, this angle right here. That is not very acute, but this angle between here and here, that's pretty acute. That's where that came from. Got it? All right, as I said, the coronary sulcus, sometimes called the atrioventricular groove, is where the right coronary artery and left coronary artery and circumflex, they live in these little grooves. Don't confuse it with a coronary sinus. Right, here's a picture. I mean, you can't really see it, but these these pipes. Here's the lad right here. Um, there's the great cardiac vein right there as well. They both run in the anterior interventricular sulcus. So that's a good one to know what runs in those sulcuses. Right, their circumflex artery doesn't run in the interventricular. It runs in the circumflex artery of the coronary sulcus. Okay, and that goes all the way around the back side of the heart, which we can't see. Pops right out here, that's coronary sulcus. Okay, this is the right coronary sulcus over here. And the right coronary artery runs in the coronary sulcus. Okay, just some, I can draw them over here. So this is right what does you tell me? Right atrium? This would be more sunken into the plane of the page. The ventricle is more out of the plane of the page. This is all the property of the right ventricle. Oh, notice notice the boundaries. The lad is the lateral bar, uh, the left boundary, and then the right coronary artery is the right boundary. That's all right ventricle. Right? And anything further lateral to the lad, that is all left ventricle. This is called the apex of the heart. Apex of the heart. We have this weird little thing sticking out here. What's that called? Oracle. That's the right oracle. There's a left oracle, but you can't see it. Okay, that's a, that connects to the right atrium. All right, we've got pulmonary trunk cut. You could see how that covers the kind of the root of the ascending aorta there. And you can see where the there's the left coronary artery. I got this all marked up, but the right coronary artery would come right out of this trunk here. Now we're looking at the back side. You could see some stuff. Um, so this is all left ventricle here. Okay, this is the descending, right there is the um, descending artery, or the, the um, posterior, or just posterior descending artery, or posterior interventricular artery, uh, and it's running in that posterior interventricular sulcus. That sulcus is also a dividing point between the left ventricle and the right ventricle as well. It's a medial cardiac vein. Interestingly enough, let me show you something else. I kind of messed it up. Let me see if I can erase all ink on slides. All right. Notice how the lad, left anterior descending, is there right anterior descending? No. That's what's weird about the lad. Um, but the lad 
circles the apex of the heart, and it anastomoses with the posterior descending. So these systems communicate together. Why am I having you remember this or bring this back up? Because heart attacks, if you get a if you get a heart attack right here, if you get a atherosclerotic plug right here, most people die. That's called the widow maker because it takes out your powerful left ventricle. Uh, all the the L, the lad it has a lot of little branches with diagonals and we didn't talk about them. Um, but it's a massive blood vessel and it supplies most of the left ventricle and you'll die without that. Even worse, it doesn't happen that often, but if you get a plug up here, um, you were going to die for sure. Usually the plugs happen down here in the little branches, smaller branches. All right, that's what I wanted to show you there. Um, but on the back side of the heart, uh, so there's the left atrium or left oracle we can see right there, that little ear-like thing. And we can see the pipes coming in. This is not a very good drawing of this, the pipes. Maybe these are okay, but this shouldn't be like that. That should be gone. I mean, this should all be... Remember that? We saw plenty of... If I taught you anatomy, I showed you these hearts. Right? The pipes will come out of here and here. They don't go like that. Not realistic drawing. But nevertheless, the, the point, thing I wanted to point out here, uh, is this a right-handed system or a left-handed system? Which one? Good. Those of you who said right-handed, why? Here's the right coronary artery coming around, and then it keeps right on going as the posterior descending. So therefore, by definition, this is a right-handed system. Here's the circumflex coming around here, and it just peters out. Now there's a huge venous pipe back here. This is the coronary sinus. Coronary sinus. And it actually doesn't show it, but Right about here, there's a drain. It, it plugs in to the right atrium and dumps blood from the heart into the right atrium. We'll see the ostium for the coronary sinus in a bit. Right. This is just to show you, this is like a um, 3CD reconstructed view. And the heart really sits the most posterior. We're looking, if you're an Ant-Man and we were on the anterior vertebral body of, oh, how about T7, T6, T7, and looking forward in a P to A direction, if we're looking like that way, P to A direction, uh, the, well, there's the vena cava, but the left atrium would be furthest back, almost you know, it doesn't sit on the posterior chest wall, but it's close. And then the rest of the heart, kind of like a tilted pyramid, projects into the plane of the page here, or really more anteriorly. Uh, so the point, your apex, will be up here. That's the most anterior part. So it's kind of that, a weird direction there. Okay, there are some veins. We said the great cardiac vein runs in the interventricular sulcus, anterior interventricular sulcus. That's the only one I really... There's an anterior cardiac vein. We don't need to worry about those. Small cardiac vein. I think that's probably your low allele. But that coronary sinus is uh, huge. That You definitely want to know that. But that's only seen on the back side of the heart. Okay, here's a real cadaver heart. Uh, you can see here's the root of the aorta here. And, yeah, they were called venous sinuses, we'll look, or aortic sinuses, we'll look at, but we just, i just been calling it the kind of the root of the ascending aorta. But you can see that there's the right coronary artery as it comes out of this little, see how this little bump is here? Uh, that is the right aortic sinus, not to be confused with the coronary sinus or the coronary sulcus. But aortic sinus is right there. We'll look at the other two aortic sinuses. Pulmonary trunk is all, notice how stiff the artery is, the aorta, and this one's all flappy looking. They pulled it out of the way. But yeah, here it goes. Now you can see the really deep, that's the right coronary sulcus that this thing is running in. And you can see just the branch right here, there's the marginal, or there's the um, acute marginal or right marginal artery. Right, there's the lad kind of running over there. 
can't quite see the circumflex. Yeah, I, I can see it actually running like this. There's the lad and that little stubby thing. That's the left coronary artery. Okay. Uh, the difference between the anatomical and the clinical base is always important. It's always worth a question somewhere. Cause you definitely need to know that. So if you saw, if you take a little exacto knife and you cut through the coronary sulcus all the way down around the heart and pull, you'll pull the atria, the left and right atria right off the heart. You'll separate that. And that's called the anatomical base if you cut through here and pull and separate the atria from the ventricles. The clinical base of the heart is something different. That is on the anterior thorax, specifically the second intercostal space, kind of parasternal, so right next to the sternum. And that's where you auscultate the aorta and the pulmonic valve. That's the clinical base of the heart. So don't get those two mixed up. Right? So if we cut through here and pulled this, if we took all of this, pulled it off because we took a little saw and sawed through here, uh, that the base of the heart would be left. We'll see a view of the base of the heart in a second. But that's just showing the coronary sulcus. Coronary sinus runs in the coronary sulcus, right? And not to be confused with the aortic sinus, which we'll look at here in a second. Okay, so here's a view, an overhead view, and we've cut the atria. We have sawed right through the coronary sulcus, and we've even sawed through the, sorry, there's the circumflex artery, and there's the right coronary artery. And we've pulled off the atria, and now we have this view. Uh, and this is the base of the heart. This is the anatomical base of the heart. I always ask this question. There's blood flowing out of these pipes right toward us. So my question is, is this systole? Ventricular systole or ventricular diastole? It's got to be systole, right? Systole ejects blood from the heart, and here's the pipes that the blood leaves through. Uh, these pipes here. Here's the aorta. There's the pulmonary trunk. So the valves are blood is flying right toward us, and these the the semilunar or the uh, the AV valves are both slammed shut. Right. Here's another picture. This is during diastole, and you can see the AV valves open, uh, and you can see the, the semilunar valves are all closed because of backwash. But I wanted to show you these aortic sinuses again. So this is a perfect cut right through the root of the aorta, but there's three little bulges here. There's a bulge over here, uh, and that's, that's on the left side. So that's the left aortic sinus, or little bulge. Then we have a right bulge right over here. That's the right aortic sinus. And then there's a bulge back here. That's the posterior aortic sinus. All right. So let's see. Yep, and that's what Drake, that'll be on the chiropractic boards. There's AKA for those. There's the right sinus of Valsalva, the left sinus of Valsalva, non-coronary sinus, so other... I don't know, medical students, what boards. You, 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 actually, you guys, when I was in medical school, about how many years ago was that? About 10 years ago? Did a quarter of medical school, and they were using Drake as well, just like chiropractors use. But so there's those other AKs as well. Who cares about that aortic sinus? Well, because above the aortic sinus, well, I guess that's that doesn't really have anything to do with aortic sinuses. I just wanted to pr present the aortic bulge or the aortic bulb. So if you have if you have blood flying out of the left ventricle under high pressure, it's going to hit the same spot of the ascending aorta over and over again, and pretty soon it starts to bulge out that section. And that's called the aortic bulb, the aortic bulb. Normally, no big deal. But on some people, especially with the connective tissue diseases, Marfan's and uh, Louis Steet, Cell Stanlers, this can get pretty big. 
and it can actually bulge into and compress the right atrium, cause a beaver dam, or even the superior vena cava, or even the main stem bronchi. Uh, so that does happen occasionally because of that aortic bulb. Okay, pathological aortic bulb. All right, we talked about this already. So 70% of the hearts have a right dominant system or a right-handed coronary artery system. Talked about that. 20% or 10% are left-handed system. And sometimes you have a co-dominant system where both the circumflex and the right coronary artery give rise to the posterior descending. It's important when you're mapping out a heart attack and trying to figure out do you need to go in and put a stent and risk pushing blood clots further into the heart. So it's important to understand the circulatory system of the heart. Here's an example of a right-handed system. There's the circumflex artery coming around. You tell me, is this right-handed? Here's the right coronary artery. Yeah, if the right coronary artery makes the posterior descending artery or posterior interventricular artery, then it's a right-handed system. So this is a right-handed system. And there's an example of a left-handed system. There's the circumflex coming around from the front. Instead of petering out, it goes right down that posterior interventricular sulcus. Name changes to posterior descending here, or posterior interventricular. Uh, but this is a left-handed system when that happens. Got it? And where's the where's the right? The right one just kind of petered out. It didn't even make it over here. Right? So that's a left-handed system. We talked about the base of the heart already. Clinical base of the heart is the right second intercostal space, parasternal, anterior parasternal region. That's where you auscultate the all pigs eat too much. You guys know that one? The aortic and pulmonic valve. Well, make sure you know this. You have to know this for lecture and lab. I used to teach this first quarter. I can't remember if I had you guys for palpation. I think I stopped teaching palpation at that point. Um, but if you haven't had this, here it is now. Uh, so all pigs eat too much. A for all aortic valve. P, pulmonary valve or pulmonic valve. E is a new one. This is the third intercostal space left parasternal border. This is a great spot to auscultate. This is called Herb's Point. We'll talk about that more when the time comes. Great, great perch. If you can only listen to one spot for heart problems, that's where you want to listen. Skip a space, the fifth intercostal space parasternal border on the left. That's the tricuspid auscultation area. And midclavicular line, just a hair inside the midclavicular line is the mitral auscultation area. So that's all pigs eat too much. All pigs eat too much. Okay, just wanted to point out here. So there's the all pigs eat too much. Those are the auscultation areas that, notice how it makes a Z pattern too, right? It's kind of like a Z. So that's the Z auscultory pattern. You can start from here and go this way. The newer books recommending you go backwards, starting down here and working this way, but don't think it really matters for boards because Bates says you can do it either way. Uh, but notice that, so there's the auscultation area. Notice that doesn't ma match the valves. You can't take a knife and dig down in the second intercostal space, right parasternal border, and find the aortic valve. There's nothing there. The aortic valve is actually right in the middle of the manubrium here. Uh, but these um, they've, these are scientifically calculated. They use really expensive stethoscopes, and they check where murmurs are coming from and where murmurs and the, the, the sound reflects to the best. Um, and this is the best place to listen, uh, even though physiologically it doesn't match up to the valve. Look at the mitral valve. Is way over here. These match the fibrous skeleton more than anything else, which we'll look at. But the sound is way down here, just inside the midclavicular line, which usually the nipple is just a little up and out, although nipples can be variable, so you shouldn't use that. All right, so that was the point of that one. 
just showing you. And these are the modern auscultation areas. Uh, some aortic stenosis may not may be found way up here at the sternoclavicular joint. Um, but for due diligence for chiropractors, if you just go in the intercostal spaces, the all pigs eat too much. That's really all you need to do. If they have a rare one up here, then that's you know kind of kind of out of luck. You're not a cardiologist. You're just doing doing the general screening. Right, there's the all pigs eat too much again. Said that mom. All right, fiber skeleton. I've learned you guys know nothing about this, and you got to know something about this. So it's a very complicated piece of tissue. It basically one of the most important things it does. It electrically insulates the atria from the ventricles. What do I mean by that? Why do you need to electrically insulate anything? Well, remember, the wave of depolarization has to sweep over the atria first. It can't jump into the ventricles, and it stops the atria depolarization from jumping into the ventricles. So it's very important, except for one little hole uh, where the penetrating fibers of the bundle of his pass through that and stick into the AV node. We'll look at that more specifically when the time comes. We'll actually kind of see a cartoon of it. Uh, so here's the AV node. Kind of an old drawing of it. It doesn't look like that anymore. There's some uh, approach tracks we'll talk about. But here's the fibrous skeleton. And this is electrically neutral. It won't let anything through there. Except there is a hole right here. Here's the bundle of hiss would be right about here. And it does have some penetrating fibers that reach through, touch the AV node. And inside the penetrating fibers run in this hole right in the center of the fiber skeleton. We'll look exactly where that uh, that is here in a second. So the fiber skeleton also makes up some annuli. If you, you guys probably don't work on cars anymore, but back in the day you could blow a head gasket or something and you would go and buy a gasket and the gasket would, if you had a V8, like one side would have four holes in it and then it was like a probably asbestos like material the gasket would look like that and then you'd clamp it down and your pistons would be underneath here uh, but it formed a very tight seal between the head and the uh, and the pistons and that's kind of what the annulus is it's like a gasket um, it does some very important things it gives a flat surface for the cusps or the valves to connect to. Because we can't have those valves leaking, right? We talked about that a little before. And so it needs a level flat surface. The valves need a level flat system to attach to. And this is it. The annuli is what the valves uh, attach to. Okay. Uh, the, they're easy to remember, at least, because they're exactly the same name as the valves. So tricuspid annulus, a mitral annulus, pulmonary annulus, and an aortic annulus. Okay, here's a first view of the fiber skeleton, kind of a cartoon. That's really a little more complicated than this, even. But everything in silver is, I mean, it looks like a gasket to me. And the part, like this part right here, well, it's surrounded the mitral valve, so that's the mitral annulus. Tricuspid annulus. Right? Aortic annulus. Get the idea? Pulmonic annulus out here. Right? So that gives a nice place for these to anchor down to. The valves to anchor down to. There's also two trigones. There's some key pieces of the fiber skeleton. There's two trigones, a left and right trigone in a central body. Here's a view of the base of the heart again. We've already seen this view. Aortic sinus here. There's the right aortic sinus. Left aortic sinus is here. Okay, posterior aortic sinus. Right here. And then we, here's this tissue. So we have this little triangle right here. And that little piece of tissue is the left fibrous trigone. So it connects the 
aorta here, the root of the aorta, or specifically the aortic sinus, the left aortic sinus, uh, right to the cusp of the bicuspid valve. Okay, so left trigone connects the left aortic sinus with the mitral, mitral annulus. Okay, and that supports one of the cusps of the mitral valve. Right, so this is a little confusing over here, uh, but this piece right here, that's the right trigone. But there's another bigger area that extends way down to there, kind of within that, uh, and that's that central fibrous body. Central fibrous body, whoops. Okay, so that's the deal. So the right trigone, that's strongest and largest. It's between uh, located in the base of the heart again. It connects the posterior aortic sinus, the mitral annulus, and the tricuspid annulus together. They help anchor uh, one of the cusps of the annul or the mitral valve as well. Right, there's just another picture of it. Also, really important, we have this thing. That's where the AV node lives. So the AV node is inside this right fibrous trigone, and it's inside the right central body as well, right? Uh, it's centered in the center. It's in the center of the fibrous skeleton. It's in within a region called the central fibrous body, CFB. Contains the amazing atrial, uh, the AV node, atrioventricular node, and it helps anchor the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. This weird central fibrous body, it just is a little, it's almost like the, the right trigone, only bigger. Uh, but So it contains the right fibrous trigone, the membranous portion of the atrial septum, and the membranous portion of the ventricular septum as well. The AV node is in there as well. Uh, the central fibrous body acts as a central hub and provides, kind of holds the glue that holds the entire fibrous skeleton together. Now why in the world it decided to do this? I have no idea. It's Windows. It's Windows 7. Still love that Windows 7 though. What's the fiber? This is a good question slide. What's the fiber skeleton do? Well, we said already it anchors. Uh, no, we didn't say. It also not only insulates the atria from the ventricles, but it also gives some, some uh, gives a surface where the myocardium can sink its teeth into. And so the atria and ventricular myocardium sink their teeth into uh, this tissue on their respective sides. It also anchors the cusps of all the four valves. We already said that. It gives them a level surface too. All right, those valves, uh, it, it gives the valve orifices, which are really nothing more than this, uh, the annuli. It gives them strength and rigidity, and it gives them a flat surface so the valves connect evenly to it. And then, as we said before, it electrically insulates the myocardium, the atria from the ventricles. You can have holes in the fiber skeleton. We'll talk about this more when the time comes. I always like to start planting a little seed, the Wolf Parkinson white seed right now. So if you have an unwanted hole, let's see if I can draw them, just a real little cartoon. All right, so that's the fiber skeleton. That's the right atrium. That's the left atrium. All right, there's the right ventricle below it and left ventricle below it. So normally, can I change or is that going to take too long to change? It's such a pain changing on this. So normally that flow of electricity goes, here's the AV node, goes into the AV node and it passes here, goes into the bundle of Hiss here. These are the penetrating fibers, the bundle of Hiss. And someone like Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and, and before I go there, so the electrical signal, it bounces off that and it can't get through, which is good because we need that time to, 
to depolarize the atria first. Remember, the atria has to contract. There's the atrial systole that fills up the ventricles. But what happens if there's a hole over here? Right? Here comes the SA node-generated current, and it sneaks through here ahead of time. So this whole area depolarizes way ahead of schedule. So that's basically what Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is. There's a hole in the fiber skeleton with very fast conducting fibers. And the current going through the atria sneaks into the ventricles ahead of time. All right, and that causes all sorts of trouble. Here's a better model of this. Uh, these fibers have a name that live in that hole. These are called Kent fibers. Here's the SA node. It's just generated an action potential. There's Bachmann's bundle. We talk about that. Uh, but yeah, and usually the current gets in here through the AV node. It's slowed down, gives ch chance these other currents to make it atria contract, and then it's released in the ventricles. But over here, this current didn't have to go this way. It, it already snuck in here and depolarized all this ventricle muscle. That's Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Um, luckily, this uh, this is a very slow movement. I mean, it's all really fast, but r relatively speaking, it's a slow depolarization. And then you got current coming down here uh, through the left and right bundle branches, lickety split. Right after this delay is let as over, the current flies down the rest of the Purkinje system, and usually there's a collision of the currents right here and they snuff each other out. So sometimes the patient can feel a palpitation when this happens. Probably not, because this happens on every beat, so they're just used to it. Of course, trouble starts if the current comes the other way and sneaks back up here. If there's no collision, we have problems. And that's AVRT. That's one of the supraventricular tachycardias we'll talk about. All right, uh, again, if the fiber skeleton gets warped, that's not a good thing. It can cause regurgitation, aortic or mitral regurgitation, and that's not good. It overfills the atria, and uh, if it's the mitral regurgitation overfills the atria, aortic regurgitation overfills the powerful left ventricle, and you'll wear that ventricle out uh, with the passage of time. Okay, we just talked about that, insufficiency. Um, yep, everything I just said. Oh, I didn't say valve uh, leaks. Why doesn't why doesn't it close? What can cause uh, it mitral or atrial insufficiency? Well, if you get degeneration of the annulus, that's the one we just talked about, and they warp, and the valves are leaky because they have an unequal surface that holds them. They don't close perfectly. All right, if this is the annulus here, here's one cusp of the mitral valve. Here's the other cusp. Great, they close perfectly. During systole, the blood flows, and it can't get out of there. But what if, what if you have a warped annulus, mitral annulus? Uh, well, then this one is maybe like that, and this one is you know, like that, and so blood can sneak through here because it doesn't close very good. Right, you can have damage. You can have infection of the chordae tendinae, the papillary muscle tumors, uh, or myocardial infarctions can cause it to leak as well if papillary muscle is killed. Uh, mutation of the valves, a bicuspid aorta. If we get time, we'll talk about that. That's a problem where there's only two cusps of the aortic valve. Aortic valve leaks during diastole. Yep, everything we said overfills the left ventricle. Starling's law is always in effect. Yep, big mess. We talked about all that. Triangle of Koch, you know nothing about, I don't think, but you should know a little bit about it. Uh, important thing about it, where is, the t where is if you're Ant-Man and you're running inside of the right atria, where is the AV node, how are you going to find the AV node to do surgery on it if you're Ant-Man? Uh, well, you follow the triangle of Koch. The tip of the triangle of Koch leads you to the AV node. So we should know. And why do we care about this thing? 
the most common supraventricular tachycardia is something called AVNRT, atrial nodal reentrant tachycardia. And you need to ablate one of those tracks, so you need to be able to find where the triangle of Koch is if you're a cardiac electrophysiologist anyway. So good to know about this, I think. So what are the borders? That's a beautiful question. Which one of the following is not one of the three borders of the triangle of Koch? Well, the ostium of the coronary sinus, that's opening the coronary sinus. The right portion of the AV orifice, which is really the annulus, it's just a little, makes that. And then something called the tendon of Todaro. You might know the eustachian valve, but the eustachian valve continues. That's the valve that kind of, the fin that guides inferior vena cava blood, it guides it into the foraminal volley in vivo when you're still cooking in your mom's tummy. Uh, so a continuation, it's a continuation of that. Let's look at a picture of it. And here's a view of the heart. Now I know why I took that slide out, and now I know why I didn't take that slide. It's kind of hard to see this, but this is a picture of the right side of the heart. Here is the inferior vena cava right here, which I can't draw. I don't know why this doesn't draw on these pictures very well. Uh, superior vena cava would be up here coming in. Inferior vena cava is here. Uh, so here's the fossa ovala. So now you should know where you are, right? There's the limb. If you know what the limb is, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's the valve of the fossa ovalis. Okay, we saw that in lab. Then here's this little fin right here. So that's called the eustachian ridge or the eustachian valve. Uh, and in vivo, it's a, like a shark fin here. You have blood flying in here. And this blood is oxygenated in an embryo or a fetus. And this fin guides the blood right through this hole, and this oxygenated blood is shot into the left atria. And then after you're born, that closes. So we'll look at that a little later. But a continuation of this fin, you could see this. I used to test my students on this. Uh, that goes right up to the tip here. Uh, here's the kind of the orifice of the coronary or of the tricuspid valve. Here's the coronary sinus, so that's kind of the base of the coronary sinus there. So that's the triangle of Koch. Those are the borders. If you follow that to the tip, that's the AV node. Also in AVNRT, there's usually an anomalous fast track right here, which, which carries signals, action potentials, way too fast, as opposed to the slower one here. But we'll talk about that when the time comes. That's why you need to know those pieces. Here's another cartoon of it. There's the fossa ovalis and for vena cava. Here's the shark fin. And then it continues on as a fin, not as prominent uh, as the eustachian valve, but still quite a prominent ridge. And that is the tendon of Todaro. All right, coronary sinus makes up the base. There's part of the, there's the valve, there's the cusp where the cusp attaches, uh, that's called the orifice. And yeah, that's the triangle. Septa of the heart. So kind of know this. There's an interventricular septum you have know and you've been tested on. Um, there is also an interatrial septa. That, and each one of those contains a membranous and kind of a muscular portion. So let's take a look at atrial first, atrial septa. There's nothing more a little faster over there. Its job is to separate the right and left atria from each other. And also, here's one you don't know, but the inferior part of the right atrium actually is has a connection with the superior part of the left ventricle, the powerful left ventricle. So that's a little weird, right? It's a good tough board question, but nevertheless. And the right atrium can connect to the left ventricle, so that's true. Difficult to see in the heart model, though. I don't really have a good picture of it. Uh, but this interatrial septa contains the famous fossa ovalis. It's made of two pieces. There's an interatrial septum. We, we said this already. And an atrioventricular septum? No, we didn't say this. Okay, this is mostly muscular, the muscular portion of the atrial septum. The interatrial septum is all the thin membranous portion. 
It's easy to get holes in here, as we'll see in our next lecture, and it contains so, the fossil volus as well. So the fossil volus is contained in the intraatrial septum. All right here's a kind of coronal view. Here's the intraatrial septum here, left or le right ventricle, left ventricle here, mitral valves. There's two of the tricuspid valves. All right, um, it's left atrium. This would be deeper into the plane of the page. This would be more out of the plane of the page. Uh, but here is the the intraatrial septum. You can see a muscular portion here, and you can see a thin portion. We can also see the valve, and there's the limbus of the fossil valve. We'll look at that more specifically in a second. So here's left ventricle. This is left ventricle territory. Oh, it's not showing up again, but right here. So there is a possibility if you've got a hole through this muscular portion here, and that's called the atrioventricular septum, uh, you could get a shunt, an abnormal shunting of blood. And we'll look at some of those as well. Now, above or deep into the plane of the page is where the membranous portion of this region comes. And there's a membranous portion of the interventricular septum, which you can't appreciate on this. It's actually a pretty complicated anatomy here. Uh, so the fossil volus, it is a thin wall of tissue, as we said, separates the medial part of the right and left atria. Embryologically, remember, it was made by two pieces of tissue. There's a septum primum that forms first, because at first the heart just has an atria like this, and then a septum grows here, that septum prima, and there's a hole, I shouldn't have, there's a hole right there. Then another septum comes and f covers the heart again, but it doesn't cover and doesn't go all the way and it leaves kind of a kind of a hole here and that's called septum segundum that comes down so the fossa ovala ovalis is after you're born when you're still in vivo still an embryo or fetus it's called foramen ovale because it lets blood pass through and into the left atrium Right, here's one that's plugged. There's a fossa ovalis. Another picture of the triangle of Koch. Nice picture there. Okay, fossa ovalis is made up of the valve in the limb. Uh, the valve is actually pure septum primum. That's why it's so thick. There's no septum secundum. So therefore, most atrial septal defects are in this thin type of tissue. Okay, super thin. You can shine a light in the left atria and see it if you're Ant-Man. Well, if Ant-Man's standing in the right atria and you shine a light in the left atria, you can see it right through the wall. Uh, the limbus is made by septum secundum that's come down. And uh, that was the leading edge of sep septum secundum back in, the, back in the day when the heart was forming. Okay, so this picture I tried to show you uh, this is the valve right here. Um, that's septum primum remnant tissue. And then septum secundum came down like a curtain to strengthen the... This is all interatrial septum here. Uh, and yeah, it strengthened everything. For whatever reason, it didn't come down on this part. So it left this region really, really small and vulnerable to hole formation. There's... So we are in the... We are, this is the right atria here. Everything is walled off. If you go through that hole, you'll be up in the right ventricle. But this is the right atria with the right wall, lateral wall removed. Uh, and there's the limb, the limbus you can see right there. And you can see such a thin little sheet here. Uh, that's the valve. And there is a little pen light in the left atrium on the other side. And we can see right through the tissue. Okay, superior vena cava is up here, inferior vena cava is here. What's this? Let's see if you're paying attention. Hmm. Well, how do we figure this out? If this is the limbus, where's the fin that guides the blood into the limbus? Here's the inferior vena cava. This is the fin coming out of the plane of the page right here. 
right? So if on the other side of that fin, that is the ostium to the coronary sinus. You can stick a probe through there. That's the third opening. All right. So this would actually be the triangle like this. Right, there's a nice movie on the embryology. It's kind of old, but it still, I mean, it's not that deep. But it gives you an idea of how it's formed. Now it's closure. We're starting to get excited with the stars, aren't we? Closure of Fremenovale is interesting. So immediately after birth, the Fremenovale is pressure closed. Because let's think about that. And becomes the fossa ovalis. So if we draw our little diagram again, there's the right atria. There's the left atria. And normally the valve is open. There's left. And we got, here's the superior vena cava blasting blood in. It's normally blood flies over to this way. Pressure is higher over here because of mom's blood. And it's lower over here because the lungs aren't even working yet. But once you're born, this changes. Pressure increases over here and it shuts that valve. I have pictures of this. Shuts that valve. And the valve is pressure sealed because the pressure is now higher in the left atria than it is in the right atria because the lungs are pushing the blood back. Okay, and that's why uh, blood, how come blood's not going to leak then? Uh, because if you go, if the pressure's higher on the left side, it pushes the flap back and blood won't leak in. If the pressure gets higher in the right, if you get pulmonary hypertension, as we're going to see, you can push that valve back open if it doesn't get welded shut. Uh, so normally, within the first year of life, that valve is welded shut. Uh, there's not there's not really little welders that go in there, of course. Uh, but the limbus gets welded to the septum sagutum. They never break apart. But you're going to be surprised how many people don't have welding, right? So there, there's what little welder is in there, and he's welding this together. So nothing will ever pull this apart. Even if the pressure gets higher over here, because we're looking in the right atria, It'll push, but it can't get through because this is welded. If you don't have a welding, you can actually get a pathological leak uh, of this deoxygenated blood into the oxygenated blood of the left atria. And that's a big problem. Welding. Here's kind of another view overhead. Uh, this is high pressure in the left atria. Low pressure after birth. Low pressure over here. Blood's being pushed back from the lungs. And so this valve is pressure sealed. And it's going to be welded right here. It's really fibrosed, fibroblast heavy, almost inflammatory process occurs from it rubbing its thought. It's rubbing over each other and it welds it shut. So what is the term patent foramen ovale, pro-patent foramen ovale? Is that always a pathology if you have a propatent foramen ovale? And the answer is no. Uh, it all depends about pressure in the left atria and right atria. It will determine whether or not it becomes pathological. But first of all, let's define a propatent foramen ovale or just a PFO or a, fram a patent foramen ovale, a propatent foramen They're all used as AKAs for each other. So, um, yeah, in a huge number of people, the welder never shows up. He never completes the job, and you don't get welded shut. And if you're, if you're that type who never got welded shut, you have a pro-patent foramen ovale, and you'll probably never know it throughout your whole life. The only people who know it is if they get pulmonary hypertension and the pressure rises in the right atria. And once the right atria pressure is above the left atria pressure, that propatent foramen ovale can open up. The ones who are welded shut, it's not going to open up. But the ones who never got welded, you're going to have a leak of, of nasty deoxygenated blood into the oxygenated blood. And the body does not tolerate that very well, as we'll see. But what, is the propatent foramen ovale a congenital disorder? 
I mean, I think it is, but Robbins thinks it's not. But other books say, so it's kind of a mixed mixed bag in that. But according to Robbins, it's not congenital uh, because you're not born immediately with a problem. It takes years for you to develop pulmonary hypertension, and that's where the problem comes on. But um, I will stay away from that question, I think. Uh, but nevertheless, we, for our purposes, we will consider it. Maybe I won't stay away from the question. You never know. Um, but it's not considered a congenital heart defect because they're not born with it. You, you don't even know if they're born with it. Right? It's called uh, acquired by Robbins anyway. You can make the diagnosis if you inject my, micro bubbles into the venous side. And when the bubbles pass through the atria, on the right atria, you have the patient do a Valsalva's test and push down real hard. And that raises the pressure in the right atria enough where some of the bubbles could actually get into the the left circulation, into the left atria. And there's these are tiny bubbles, not big, big enough to do any damage. But there is a way to diagnose it with that. Where did it get the name propatent from? That's because they... When people die and they do opstopsy, the pathologist takes a probe and pushes on that limb, the valve right here between the valve and the limbus. We had a heart, uh, we had a couple hearts. I've been here for five and a half years. We've had two hearts where you could take a probe and push right between the valve and the limbus. They had a probe patent from an ovale. Uh, the ones we have in there now don't. I haven't seen one for a while. You can push, don't push too hard because you rip the, the valve is really thin. But that's where probe patent came from. Okay, and you'll think, oh my God, I got a probe patent for aminobali. I'm in trouble. I'm going to leak. I'm going to leak blood because I have, it's not sealed. Is it going to leak? No, if you have normal heart, you have way higher pressure on the left. Uh, so it's going to be pressure sealed on the left. I have a picture of this? Yeah. So here's a cartoon of run of the mill heart. There's the low pressure and the right atria, about 5 millimeters of mercury, 50 millimeters of mercury in the left atria. And even though that, I mean, the flap could open, it's not. It's pressure seal. It's held right against the interventricular or interatrial septum by the pressure. So it's pressure sealed, and you'll never have a problem with it. So look at this number, 75%, 25% of the patient's it, or people don't have it sealed. 75% have a normal, permanently sealed fossovalus. Okay, so they don't have to worry about it. But what about the other 25%? That means an incredible 25%. I've seen 30% in some uh, authors and studies. 25%, we'll go with Robbins, 25% of humans says that the they have, the, uh, they have a propane for aminovale. It never sealed. The valve in the limbus never sealed. The welders never showed up to work and never finished the job. So that's called a propane for aminovale or patent for aminovale or a PFO. Okay. What's the sequelae of a... I like this slide. I've asked a lot of questions on the slide and people still get them wrong. Pro, a patent for amino volley. What's the sequelae on a normal person? What will the sequelae be? And I'll have the question just like that. What? And we know what sequelae is. That's the outcome, or it's, that's the negative, uh, the result of having something. The consequence. What's the consequence of having a amino volley? Uh, well, it does carry a slight risk of stroke uh, in the long term, and TIA. And how could this be? Because Maybe you're weightlifting or having sex, having an orgasm, super high pressures, uh, and you just had really, really bad luck. You had a uh, venous thrombosis and a piece of that broke loose, and you had an embolism coming right through the right ventricle at the same time uh, you were doing a squat or sitting on the toilet, constipated, pushing down, or lifting weights, or having sex, having orgasm. Right at that high pressure moment, the the embolism could slip out of the pulmonary system and into the arterial system, and that is big trouble, right? Uh, you can, did I have, where's that heart? Oh, it doesn't show it, but you get a, you get a, oh, I have a picture coming up. Um, 
Yeah, that's called a paradoxical embolism. You get an embolism in that right atria, or I'm sorry, in that left atria. That's a dangerous bomb because it could go, th uh, it could go out of the heart, it could go into the left common carotid artery and go up in the noodle and give you a stroke and kill you. Maybe it'll go through the aortic sinus, the right aortic sinus, and go in and clog the uh, the right coronary artery and give you. I mean, you would die from that. You can't have those big pipes clogged up. So they're very, very dangerous. They could go anywhere. Those are called paradoxical. Why paradoxical? What's the paradox? Well, it's an embolism. We think it's always venous. But here's a situation where the venous embolism actually turned into an arterial embolism uh, because of a propane foramen ovale. Okay, could go into the lungs. We're looking at all the sequelae. Uh, what are we looking at? pulmonary hypertension. So what could increase the chances of your propate and foramen ovale opening? Well, you'd have to get higher pressure on the right atria than on the left. What could do that? Pulmonary hypertension could do that. So what could cause pulmonary hypertension? We've already talked about this. So a beaver dam anywhere in the, in the heart, uh, in the lungs. We've talked tons about this. So I'm going to just kind of skip over this stuff causes a pulmonary hypertension, so it's back. So this this material won't be on your final next week. Or, no, the final this week, right? Your CVPP is Thursday. It won't be on that final, but it'll be on, or it won't be on that midterm, but it'll be on your final. But So this stuff is back. So lung disease, uh, chronic vascular constriction of the pulmonary arteries. We talked about some people, there's some research that shows some endothelial cells over-secrete endothelin and it causes vasoconstriction of the arteries. And it's a beaver dam if the microcirculation, the pulmonary microcirculation gets, it's hard to push blood through it. And so the right heart fails. Chronic thromboemboli disease where the lungs are all scarred up for thousands of little blood clots being bombed in there. Left ventricular failure, that's the number one cause of pulmonary hypertension is left ventricular failure. It's also the number one cause of right heart failure is left heart failure because of the beaver dam phenomenon. Mitral aortic valve disease, uh, moderate to large atrial septal defect. We'll talk about these next time, next lecture. We'll talk about Eisenmenger syndrome. Uh, what is Eisenmenger syndrome? That's when pressure changes from low right-sided pressure and it becomes high because of hypomenor hypo it becomes high because of pulmonary hypertension and it can cause paradoxical emboli it can cause a pathological right to left shunt we'll talk about that when the time comes here's someone who died and during the autopsy they didn't even have to push the probe through there did they it just bloop, fell right apart so that's a propane foramen ovale there's no rip or tear it's not a atrial septal defect because there's the limb right there. If you see a hole right where the limb is, that's a PFO. All right, is that about time? I think that's probably about time. That's enough slides. Let's stop about, uh, we'll talk about the sequelae of left to right shunts next time. See you later.